Hear, now hear the word of the Lord from John 12, verses 27 through 50. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of the world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. Lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn. And I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw the glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come to the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me does not receive my word, um, does not my words as a judge. The word I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Well, welcome again to Sacred City Church. Okay, okay, all right. We're getting it figured out. Sorry, guys. We're getting it figured out. Uh, my name is Justin, and I am the lead pastor here at the church. I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving this week. I know I did. And as Scott mentioned already, next week begins the Advent season. Now, Advent is a Latin word. That means arrival, and we celebrate the first arrival of Jesus, so we look back at Jesus' first coming, and we look forward to Jesus' second coming. And it is my favorite time of the year. This year, as, as he said, we're going to be celebrating Advent by taking a small break from the book of John as we've been going verse by verse through the book of John, and we're going to be spending some time going deeper in our understanding of some traditional Christian hymns, songs like Come, O long-expected Jesus. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Joy to the world. Hark the herald and O holy night have been sung by Christians for hundreds of years and they are packed full of glory. There's, there's treasures in those hymns that many of us sing regularly and yet we don't recognize the riches that lie within them. So each week over Advent, we're going to look at one Christmas hymn, and we're going to study the biblical and theological background of the song to lead us into deeper worship of Jesus during this Christmas season. So that begins next Sunday. Also, I want to bring your attention to the little bookstore area we have in the 
atrium. We've got some new devotionals. Uh, there's one, it is a daily liturgy guide to take you from Advent all the way through the Epiphany season. And I would highly recommend you pick up one of those. Uh, that's what I'm going to be doing in my devotional time over this season. It is a great new resource. Um, there really is, listen, there, there really is, I know we hear this a lot, but there really is a war going on each Christmas. A war for our worship, for our attention, for our gratitude, for our glory. The world wants us to get caught up in the hustle and bustle, the buying and sentimentality, to forget why we celebrate this historic event each year. And we as Christians must push back. We must go to war and dig into the real reason to celebrate Christmas. We must study harder. We must sing louder. We must decorate our homes with such zeal that our neighbors think that just maybe the light of the world did come to this earth to show us who God is and what he's like. So, I, my, listen, my back hurts because I've been on a ladder doing that for three days, okay? <laughs> so all of that begins next week. And I can't wait to celebrate Advent with you all this year for the first time in our own building. Yeah. Now, just so you can prepare, Christmas Eve is on a Sunday this year. So we're going to have our normal Sunday gathering on Sunday morning. And then we will have our traditional Christmas Eve candlelit service, Christmas Eve night at 7 p.m. So two services on Christmas Eve. That's what's going ahead. That's, what, that's what's happening in the future here. Now, as they're still trying to get these lights figured out, we don't know what's going on. Let me pray for us this morning. I might, this maybe we go disco mode this morning. I don't know. All right. We got rid of the, we had the, the spinny ball in the theater, right? And now we're, we recreate it with the flashing lights this morning. I don't know what's going on. Let me pray for us. <clears throat> Father God, we do thank you that you are a God who speaks. You are a God who spoke to us in your word. And I pray now that we could calm our minds, we could calm our hearts, that you would direct us to understand your word that you spoke to us in this chapter of the Gospel of John. God, I need your grace this morning. I need you to think through my mind and speak through my vocal cords that I am just a man, and so I need the Holy Spirit to fill me, the Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me in all truth, that we want your people, the sheep of your pasture, to hear your voice. We don't want to hear my voice, God. We don't want to hear my words, my opinions, and my ideas. We want them to hear yours. And so would you direct me towards that end this morning and direct all of your people to listen with Christian ears this morning. Father, we continue to pray for Isla. She fights cancer. We thank you for the victories that have been won and we know there's still battles ahead and we ask that you would give her strength in her body, continue to heal her. We thank you for the healing that's taken place in others like Judy Kenor. We thank you for the work that you've been doing there. We, continue to, we ask that you would continue to bring healing to her body. We pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right, so here's where we're going this morning. I want you to know and see and pursue the glory that you were created for. The glory that you were created for. Now, did you know that you were created for glory? It's not really a word that we use too often anymore. And when we do, because it's all over the Bible, most of the time, we don't really know what it means. What comes into your mind when you hear the word glory? Well, when I hear the word glory, the first thing I think of is fame. The person who finds glory on the football field finds success, and that success comes with it a certain level of fame and recognition. Their name is uttered on ESPN and every sports talk show and podcast for days or possibly even years. Their jersey sales skyrocket and maybe one day their jersey will be retired and hung from the rafters in the stadium and they will make it into the hall of fame. Or think of the singer or actor or YouTuber who finds glory. What does that mean? It means they have become famous. They are better known than others. They have a large following of people who look to them and say, you are awesome, you are special, you are unique. And millions of people rush into stadiums and, theater, and theaters to hear them or click on their videos to watch them and be in their presence. Why? They want the glory. 
But then I also think of glory as splendor or radiance or brightness or beauty. The sun is the most glorious thing in our solar system because of its power to give off light and life to everything on earth. And to a lesser degree, a beautiful person has a glory about them. We long to look at them and appreciate their beauty. That's glory. But then there's another sense of glory, and that is weight. Weight or value or significance. When it comes to gold, its glory is marked by its scarcity and weight. It's a heavier metal, and when, it's, when sifted, it sinks to the bottom. Its weight is its glory. Its value is derived from it being heavier and scarcer than other metals found in the earth. See, this sense of glory doesn't just mean physical weight, of course. It means gravity, the power to pull things into its orbit. I remember when almost 17 years ago, the doctor placed our firstborn baby son into my arms for the first time, and he definitely wasn't famous. He wasn't that beautiful in the moment either, as he was full, covered in blood and gunk. He only weighed 7.7 pounds, but that moment was full of glory. A new weight was put in my arms that literally changed the entire direction and course of my life. He was my son, my one and only, and that glorious moment changed a young man into a father. Through all of the fear and trepidation, I knew in that moment that this was what I was made for. It was a glorious moment. Now, I could keep going. But for the sake of time, let me just say that glory has at least these three connotations. Fame, beauty or splendor, and weight, gravity. And God tells us in his word that we were made for all three. We were created by God to seek after glory, and I would harbor a bet that the majority of your life is spent living, seeking after some kind of glory. It's why we work so hard. We want the glory that comes from success. It's why we are obsessed with copying famous people. We want their glory to rub off on us. And our desire for glory is also why we get so anxious and so depressed when our life isn't going the way we want it to. We desperately want something that can give us glory, but we just can't seem to get it. We're searching for glory, and it just seems right outside our grasp, and it keeps us on a treadmill, running, 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 exhausting ourselves, trying to grasp the glory, but we just can't quite get it. What we're going to learn in our text today is that you were built for glory. But only the glory of God can actually satisfy your soul. Anything other than that won't be enough to give your life the ultimate meaning, ultimate value, ultimate significance that you're looking for. So just what does it mean to live for the glory of God? Well, let's dig in and see what Jesus says. Remember last week in chapter 12, verse 23, Jesus entered into Jerusalem. We've called it his triumphal entry. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Not distracting at all. Listen, I said a few weeks ago that I'm a professional and it's hard to distract me. And so now my staff is going, let's see. <laughs> let's just see how much of a professional this guy is. If you hit two, if you hit two and it doesn't fix it, forget about it. All right, we're good. Jesus enters into Jerusalem, his triumphal entry. He comes in riding on a donkey 
And remember, Joel mentioned it already. He said over and over in the Gospel of John that my hour has not yet come. My time has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. And now all of a sudden he says, my hour is here. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Here Jesus was speaking of himself, and he said that his glory was going to be like the glory of a wheat seed. Now that's an interesting illustration. The glory of a wheat seed. What's the glory of a wheat seed? Well, if you look at that wheat seed in your hand, it doesn't look that glorious. It's small. It's insignificant. It's not that beautiful. But the glory of the wheat seed is a hidden glory. It's the glory that you take that seed and you put that seed in the ground and you bury it, and that seed dies in the ground, and then it breaks open, and, it, and once it breaks open and it grows up into a full plant, that's, that one little seed reproduces on average 110 different seeds every single harvest. That means one small, insignificant-looking seed has the inherent power to cover the whole earth given enough time. Jesus said this in speaking of his death, burial, and resurrection. He said, if you look at me, you don't see much glory, but if you put me in the ground, watch. <laughs> you put me in the ground, see what happens. And Jesus dies, and he goes in the tomb, and he comes back, and he's risen to new life, and he ascends to the Father, and he sends the Holy Spirit, and now there's Christians over the whole face of the globe. See, his glory was a hidden glory. Just like a wheat seed, Jesus' glory would be seen in bringing life out of death. Now we're in verse 27. So if you've got your Bibles, open them up with you. There are Bibles in the, underneath each chair if you need them. Here Jesus is continuing on. We just go verse by verse through books of the Bible around here. Jesus says this, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, Save me from this hour? Now, first thing we need to see is Jesus was not some kind of robot. Jesus was a man, a full, fully man like we are. He was without sin, but Jesus knows he's entering into Jerusalem, and the end of this week will end in his death. And guess what? I'm just, I don't have any qualms saying Jesus was afraid. Jesus was worried. Jesus was anxious. We see all of that fear and that worry and that anxiety kind of come to fruition in the garden when he's crying out to God, like if there's any other way, take this cup from me, and his capillaries burst on his face and he starts sweating drops of blood, right? Jesus isn't just skipping to the cross. He, he feels the weight of that glory on him, and it feels like it might, might crush him, but then he is a real man, and when the going gets tough, the tough get going, and that's exactly what Jesus does here. He says, what am I going to say? Save me from this hour? Look at his next statement. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Jesus came to die. He didn't come to just live a life as a glorious example for us to follow. He came to live the life that we cannot live and to die the death that we deserve. That's why he came to this earth. He came to die. That was his purpose. He put on flesh so that he could go in the ground. Verse 28. Jesus says, Father, glorify your name. Now that is the verb that describes the action of seeing something and esteeming it as glorious. So when you see something as valuable and you see that and you esteem it and you say, that's worth a lot of money or that's amazing or that's glorious, you're glorifying that thing. Jesus says, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. And I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now is the judgment of this world. 
Now will the ruler of this world be cast out? Jesus here speaking of Satan. That Jesus is going to be casting out Satan. He's going to be throwing down Satan with his victory on the cross. Verse 32, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. How fascinating that Jesus saw his crucifixion, him being lifted up from the earth and brutally tortured and killed. This would be the magnet that draws believers to himself. Right? It wasn't his wise teaching. It wasn't him raising people from the dead. It wasn't him healing people after, over and over again or the miracles that he did. No, it's going to be his death. Now think about that. That is the most repulsive spectacle I can imagine. A man hanging naked on the cross, hands pierced, feet pierced, crown of thorns upon his head, beaten within an inch of his life, Moments before, gasping, trying to keep himself upright so he doesn't suffocate under his own weight. And he says, that is going to be the thing that draws people to me. What? Again, it's the upside down nature of God's kingdom. Verse 33, he said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, we have heard from the law, the Old Testament, that Christ remains forever. Christ will get an eternal throne. And so they think, how could this guy die? You can't, if you claim to be the Christ, you can't actually die. Well, Christ's throne, first off, is in heaven. And so that is how he gained his throne. I'm sorry. How can we say this son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? So Jesus said to him, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, that means while you're with me, believe in the light, believe in me, that you may become sons of light. Jesus here is offering people to partake in his glory. Uh, he is the light of the world. He's offering you to, to come and be sons and daughters of light. Verse 37, this is where things get heavy. I'm gonna tell you this. These next few verses are some of the most controversial things that Jesus ever said. We're going to have all kinds of questions when we read through them. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still not, did not believe in him. Now guys, I know as I was a kid growing up, I, I thought, Jesus, if you just showed up to me in a dream... If you would just, like when my, when my Nintendo quit playing and I would lay hands on it and say, Jesus, please, I'm, right? I'm playing Tecmo Bowl, come on, come on, please, right? And he often didn't give me the sign I was looking for. I was like, it would be so much easier to believe if you just gave me signs. Well, over and over in the Gospel of John, we see that I faith isn't saving faith. People watched him turn water into wine. They watched him walk on the water. They watched him raise the dead. And they still didn't believe. Why? Because it, unbelief isn't just something, you know, we deal with in our head. It goes all the way to the core of our being, all the way down to our heart, to our soul. And ultimately, we were about to see God himself is in control of who and who doesn't believe in him. Verse 38. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah, so this was, prophet Isaiah wrote this roughly 600 years before Jesus. And John's seeing the life of Jesus and he says, oh, this reminds me of what Isaiah wrote in his account. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And here is where it gets heavy. Therefore, they could not believe. Therefore, they could not believe. Why couldn't they believe? Why wouldn't they just choose to believe? Look, you're seeing all these miracles. Just believe, just believe. How many of us say that to our family members? How many of us say that to our friends? Just believe. What is wrong with you? <laughs> Can't you see the glory in Jesus Christ that I see? Why won't you believe? Look what the gospel says in verse 40, quoting from Isaiah. He, speaking of God, God has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest 
they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory. Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus before Jesus was on on the scene, that God gave him a vision and he saw the glory of Jesus. And so he spoke of him. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. So some people of the religious establishment saw the glory of Jesus, believed in him, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't speak his name. They wouldn't confess it because they didn't want to be thrown out of the synagogue. They didn't want to lose the favor of their friends, of their colleagues. They didn't want to be looked down upon like one of those crazy people that actually believe that Jesus is the Christ. Look why they did that. Verse 43 is a damning text. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Here's the idea. We all live for that which we think is most glorious. So it's normal and natural for you to live for your family, for you to live for your kids, to live for your career, or trying to be famous. It is totally normal and natural for you to try to make as many friends as possible and never really have your own opinions in fear that they might reject you. That's how most people live their lives. It's totally normal to be obsessed with your looks or your body, or your clothes, and do whatever it is in your power to look beautiful, or cool, or to feel accepted. That's all normal. That's what most people do. I don't know if anybody saw the Dallas Cowboys football game this weekend. Dolly Parton comes out at halftime. (laughs) 77 years old Dolly Parton. Looked like a Barbie doll from the dollar store. <laughs> I was like, first off, what happened? I, I, could, I, I literally couldn't believe it. 77-year-old, and the Bible specifically tells us that there is a glory in our age. There is a glory that comes with gray hair. There is a glory that comes with maturing. We are obsessed with the glory that comes from man, trying to stay young, look young. We spend an awful lot of money on it. We've got a whole lot of doctors employed in helping us fight those age lines and wrinkles. Jesus says, we seek the glory that comes from man and not the glory that comes from God. See, why are normal people, just normal, everyday, average people obsessed with these things? Because they want glory. They want people to think highly of them. They desperately need the approval of others. They, that means that we, seek some, we see some group of people as the glory dealers. And if we can get in with that group of people, their glory will somehow rub off on us. We just have to work our way into that group and we'll finally feel good about ourselves. Jesus says, we seek the glory that comes from man. But the prophet Isaiah says the ultimate reason why people care more about the glory that comes from man than the glory that comes from God, listen, is that God himself has blinded their eyes has hardened their heart so that they can't see him. You look at the cross and you, ugh, you turn away from it. You look at fame, you look at prestige, you look at power, you look at wealth, that's what I'm living for. Now this is one of the clearest places in all of scripture that shows that God is sovereign over salvation And it causes us to ask all kinds of questions. Many of them have been asked by you, and I tried to answer them on the Sacred City Life podcast this past week. So there's two episodes out that you can go and listen to that. I'm not going to get into all that today. I don't have time for that. What I want to do is actually turn these statements 
on their head this morning and show you what they mean for those of us who find Jesus as glorious. Like, if you look at the cross and you see the glory of God in the cross, what did God do to your mind and to your heart and to your emotions and to you, you know, your eyes that enables you to see that and go, that's amazing, that's beautiful, I treasure that. What did God have to do in you for you to see that? If you see God as most glorious, if you recognize him to be the source of all goodness, truth, and beauty, and his son Jesus, as Hebrews 1.3 says, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. That's who Jesus is. So if God is truly the most important thing to you, that means that God himself has opened your spiritual eyes. He's opened your eyes to see his beauty and his value and his worth. He has softened your heart to receive his word as truth. And what it also means is if this has happened, God himself has already begun to heal you. And he heals us not by lessening the glory of any of our normal pursuits. Like family, work, beauty, those are all still good things. They are great things. What God does is he opens up our eyes to a greater glory that puts those things into perspective for us. He opens our eyes to the glory of God. And once we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, we become better husbands and better fathers and mothers and better employees and better bosses. We put the lesser things in order in their proper place. Jesus says, and we all, or Paul said this, we all, listen to this, with unveiled face, with unveiled face, who, who, who removed the veil? God himself removed the veil. We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. As we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus, God is changing us into his image. It's a, it, we don't even perceive it. We can't even know... So when we were doing the remodeling on this building, um, I, I used to be a contractor, and so I brought in some of the guys that I used to work with 20 years ago and worked with them, thought everything was fine, thought everything was normal, and I ran into another guy. I ran into another guy that we used to work with, and he said, man, heard the project getting finished. Everything's going great. Yeah, 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 it's going great. And I said, man, I want to tell you, this guy, was, this guy that you used to work with was talking to me. He's like, he said, Justin Dean is not the same guy that I used to work with 20 years ago. And I looked at him and go, you're right, brother. I'm not the same guy. Why? Because God has been changing me from one degree of glory to the next. And listen, I don't wake up one day and go, woo, I feel more glorious today, baby. But what is actually happening, those who walk with Jesus and keep our eyes fixed on his face, he is making us more like himself. And that means he's making us more glorious and more fit for glory. See, it was God who unveiled your face that enabled you to behold the glory of the Lord. And it is God that while keeping your eyes locked on Jesus, it is God who is at work in you, changing you from one degree of glory to another. All of this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Verse 44. And Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in whom who sent me, the Father. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. So if you want to know what God is like, you look at Jesus. If you want to know what God is like, you look at Jesus. Jesus is the exact imprint of his nature. Verse 46, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words, has a judge. The word that I have spoken will, spoke, spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak, and I know that this commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father 
has told me. Here's the idea. God sent Jesus to show us what God is like. We are meant to see his glory, the glory of the only son of the father, and come to him to be saved from our sins of seeking our ultimate meaning in the pursuit of lesser glories. Do you see that? You need to be saved from your sinful pursuit of seeking your identity in lesser glories. God doesn't tell us to stop searching for glory. He doesn't snap our hands away from glory. He's saying you're seeking lesser glory and you're never going to be satisfied. Seek me, the source of all glory. He is the fountainhead of glory itself. Listen to what David wrote in Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Do you hear that description of God? Do you hear that description of God? In his presence is the fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. See, when we spend our lives pursuing the things of this world, we are in effect slurping mud puddles in the street when God is offering us to drink deeply from the fountainhead of joy. Listen to the way Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. He, God, will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing, look at this, seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. I want, guys, I think there's a misconception that God doesn't want you to seek glory. Paul says right here, no, 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 look. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, God will give you eternal life. He's not saying don't seek for glory and immortality and honor. He's saying seek for it in God. Seek for it in the only place of ultimate meaning, value, and significance in God himself. Look, he will give eternal life. But though for those, here it is, who are self-seeking. What what does it mean to be self-seeking? That I'm seeking my own glory. I'm seeking the glory of man. I want other people to speak well of me. I care more about what the crowd says about me than what God himself says about me. For those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but instead obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But look at this. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also for the Greek, for God shows no partiality. Listen, you want the glory of being known? You want the glory of being famous? Well, when God himself calls you to himself, and you respond to him by trusting in Jesus. It says, God has your name written in his book of life. Think about that. God is the most important being in all of existence. He's the most glorious, and one day, his face will be turned towards you, and he will say, if you are in Christ, well done, my good and faithful servant. There is nothing more famous than that. When you have the praise of the God who created you, you were, that's what you were built for. That's why we want success and we want people to like us and all these different things. But when we get it, it never quite satisfies. Never quite satisfies us. Why? You were built for God himself to say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now I'm going to quote C.S. Lewis a bunch here. So just be prepared. He wrote a, wrote a book called The Weight of Glory. It's one of my favorite of C.S. Lewis books. And C.S. Lewis, in this book, he says this, quote, I can imagine someone saying that he dislikes my idea of heaven as a place where we are patted on the back. But proud misunderstanding is behind that dislike. In the end, 
That face, which is the delight or the terror of the universe, must be turned upon each of us, either with one expression or with the other, either conferring glory, inexpressible, or inflicting shame that can never be cured or disguised. What's he saying there? To have God know our name. To have chosen us and adopted us into his family You literally couldn't get more famous than that. And all of this brings greater glory to God. And it increases our own joy. Now, we can be tempted to think, man, I'm going to stand before the throne of God and God's just going to take, just going to look at the list of everything I've done and everything that I've not done. And he's, how's he judging me? Like you, oh, I think I'm a good person. I hope I'm a good person. That's not how God judges us. The only way God judges us are you, you are either in Christ or you're outside of Christ. In other words, Christ has either taken your sins to the cross and he paid for them there and then he gifts you his righteousness and so you stand in Jesus Christ not condemned or you stand before the throne of God completely in your own righteousness and then you're going to get the list of what you've done good and what you've done bad and here's the deal. God doesn't grade on a curve. We're all sinners. We're all sinners, right? And the consequences, the wages of sin, Scripture says, is death. Lewis again says this, to please God, to be a real ingredient in the divine happiness. What? To be loved by God, not merely pitied, but delighted in as an artist delights in his work or a son. It seems impossible, a weight or burden of glory which our thoughts can hardly sustain, but so it is. Here, here's the idea. I can't, I can't, I can't. Words fail here. Lewis does a lot better. When I felt the weight of my son's glory in that moment, right? And I'm a proud father in that moment. God feels that way about his children. God's happiness is caught up with us. I, I, as a father's happiness is caught up with his sons. There's a glory there. The father of the universe knows your name. I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. Jesus Christ did not die for a faith, faceless humanity. He took your name to the cross. He took your face to the cross. He died for you. Now think about that. So let's just say the first aspect of glory is fame. I don't think there's any, you can't be any more famous than God to know your name, and to delight in you. The second one was beauty. God is the source of all beauty. He is beauty itself. And he, we've already read, is making us into his image from one degree of glory to another. That means that one day when we enter into his presence we might not even be able to recognize one another because God is in the process of doing an extreme makeover on us right now. But God is going to do even more than just make us beautiful. Lewis says this again. We do not merely want to see beauty, though God knows even that is bounty enough. We want something else which can hardly be put into words to be united with the beauty we see, to pass into it, to receive it into ourselves, to bathe in it, to become part of it, right? Isn't that true? Like, parents, did you have your kids step out and see the beauty of the snow? And did you have to say, don't do it? <laughs> We're going to church, after church. But you, they see the snow and they're like, they don't like... Church clothes, we don't care. They want to be in it, right? There's something about us. You're standing on a beach and you're looking at the glorious sunset and you want more than just to behold it. You want to be part of it. You want to experience it. God is beauty himself and he's inviting us into himself. (sighs) 
See, right now, we're walking by faith. Jesus has saved us. God has forgiven us. The Spirit has filled us. But we're walking by faith and not by sight. That means we are all still on the outside of heaven, kind of looking in, wondering what it's going to be like when we get there. What is it going to be like to see God face to faith? face? What's it going to be like to be in his presence? But when we die or when Christ comes back again, we will finally, listen to this, be let into the heart of things. We will finally know, like know God, as we, we will finally be known by God And know God as we ourselves are known by God. Finally, we'll get into the heart of things. We will hear him say that we are loved and accepted by him. And he will give us a glory and honor and peace that is absolutely beyond our current understanding. That's what awaits us. And I think Christians today, they don't think about that future glory enough. They think about the battles and the struggles and the parenting and all the stuff that we've got to do. And they don't think about what's this all for? Where are we headed? What's God going to do to the world and to us at the end of all things? He's going to make us beautiful. He's going to invite us into that. The last aspect of glory that I mentioned was weight. Weight or value or significance. Here's my last Lewis quote for the day. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. Little G's there. Don't freak out. To remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. Or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are, in some degree, helping each other to one or other of these destinations. Here's here's the idea. If you are in Christ, you are saved, but you are also being saved. This is called the process of sanctification, that God is making you from one degree of glory into another more like his son. In one sense, you are becoming more significant, you're becoming more famous, you're becoming more beautiful in God's eyes throughout your entire life. And all that happens when you die is that process goes warp speed. You get glorified like this. That's all that happens. So here's Lewis's idea of heaven and hell is we are all on a path to either heaven or hell, and we are either becoming more significant, more beautiful, more glorious, or in this life right now, we're becoming less beautiful and less glorious and less significant. This is why in one of his allegories, he talks about the people in hell travel through heaven, and they're like ghosts, they're less significant, and they would step on the grass in heaven, and the grass in heaven would pierce their feet, and they, oh, they, they, were, they hated heaven, because heaven was too real for them. Every single person we meet, including us, is on the process of becoming either that glorified person or that devilish person. We're on the process every single day. And Jesus Christ himself, if we're in Christ, is making us more and more and more significant, like himself. And Jesus, this whole idea of glory, this whole idea of how do you become glorious and how do you become more significant and how do you become more famous, Jesus is saying it comes through the cross. It comes through the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ is the point of decision for the world. It's either the place of our salvation in which Jesus is sacrificed in our place for our sins or it's the place of judgment by which we stand condemned already, the scriptures say. Through Jesus' victory on the cross, all of humanity is either judged or saved. My question for you this morning is can you see the glory in the cross of Jesus Christ? 
Can you see the glory, the hidden glory in the cross of Christ? Can you see it this morning? If you can, it's because God himself has unveiled your face and given you the eyes to believe. And for that, we should worship. Let me pray for us. Father God, we, we come to you this morning in absolute dependence upon you. We, we live our lives most of the time pretty confident, pretty self-assured. And we read a text like this that says, you control whether we believe or not, and it's a shocking verse. It reminds us that we are not God, that you are. That we are not sovereign, that you are. And Father, I pray that every one of us in this room, we wouldn't love our family less. We wouldn't love our spouse less. We wouldn't love our job less. We would love you more. That we would see the weight of glory in the face of Christ, the Son of God dying for us, that the cross itself would catch us up in its gravity. And our life would revolve around the cross and not any lesser glory. Father, I pray even now that you're giving those in this room who've never believed, you're giving them the faith to believe and they're choosing to put their trust in you. And for those of us who do believe, we come and we, we get to, man, I, I'm just so thankful that we get to be invited to your table and you get to feed us and give us what we need for life and godliness this morning. And so, Father of mercies, thank you for this gift of bread, which we confess provides us with the body of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to enable us to eat of it in faith and to be made more fully members of his heavenly body through Christ our Lord. Father of mercies, thank you for the gift of this wine, which we confess provides us with the blood of your Son, our Savior. We ask you to enable us to drink of it in faith and to be conformed more and more to the image of his death through Christ our Lord. Jesus, on the night that you were betrayed, you took this bread and you broke it and you said, this is my body broken for you. You tell us to eat it until you come again. You took the cup and you, of wine and you said, this is my blood that covers all of our sins, the cup of the new covenant. You tell us to drink it until you come again. And so as Christians this morning, we come to your table and we ask you to feed us what we need. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen.